Motion controls have become a huge part of gaming in recent years, whether we're talking about PlayStation VR, the HTC Vive, or the surprisingly timeless experiences included in the Wii Sports games, the motions that we make and how they are registered within the hardware that we're using is an experience that ranges from feeling almost magical when it's done right to being infinitely frustrating and boring when done wrong. Most experiences end up being somewhere in between though, and even though a lot of gamers even to this day don't really care for motion controls and dismiss them as a gimmick, despite the long healthy list of games that have precisely figured out how to do it well, there is still perhaps a larger audience for software that integrates our own physical movements and our environments into a video game than ever before. Getting this input method to work for video games has been a rough journey to get to this point, and arguably still has a ways to go before it's truly perfected across the board. Even though modern iterations of motion controls are impressive and offer very unique experiences, we still have our clunky, not so well executed experiences out there to sift through. Before getting too deep into that topic though, it's probably worth mentioning the gorilla in the room, the Nintendo Wii. This system was advertised as the future of controls and thusly gaming itself, and it kind of was. It revolutionized how the world of gaming looks at motion controls, it simplified implementation of motion controls, and managed to do all of this while launching at a cheaper price than its competitor systems, helping make the Wii one of the best selling consoles of all time. That success may have served as a launching pad for a lot of the motion based hardware and software that we see today, but it wasn't possible without the more rudimentary attempts that preceded it. Motion controls have technically existed for decades now going back into the 1980s with popular arcade games, predominantly driving games like Hang On that let the player sit on a fake motorcycle that was essentially a giant controller. The way this method worked was simple, if you shifted your weight to the left, it would be the equivalent equivalent of pressing left on a joystick or a directional pad, and if you shifted your weight to the right, the same would happen for that direction. This method of implementing motion controls was replicated by many other similar games and can still be found in arcades today. It's not nearly as complicated as it might seem to the layman, and it brings a certain amount of immersion to driving games that isn't really possible when you're holding a normal controller. Slightly modifying that idea and just applying it in a different way were the wheel controllers like the Zoomer that worked with popular systems systems like the NES, the SNES, and the Sega Genesis. These also essentially functioned just like controllers and would send the same input signals to the console they were being used on as any controller would. The only difference here was how the player executed the input. Instead of pressing a button, you turned a wheel to a point that would trigger the corresponding input. Like the motorcycles in the arcade, it felt advanced even though it really wasn't from a technical standpoint. Other peripherals came and went that were designed to get the player up off of the couch and moving around like Nintendo's Zapper, Sega's Light Phaser, and lesser known, less successful things like the Power Glove and the Sega Activator that perhaps bit off more than they could chew as accurate sensors just weren't as available as they needed to be at the time in that industry. The Sega Activator itself was an interesting attempt though because it really did try to take the player's full body into account when calculating inputs. Instead of pressing buttons, sensors would be triggered, which was a pretty advanced idea at the time. Of course it barely worked at all, but it was an important step as the DNA of this particular device can be seen in modern devices like the Xbox's Kinect, which, say what you will about the library, took a pretty interesting stab at motion controls with an RGB color VGA video camera, a depth sensor, and a multi-array microphone that all painted a united picture of red, green, and blue collar components as well as body type and facial features. Unfortunately, the potential of that combination of technologies was largely squandered by games that just weren't fun and largely didn't utilize the potential of the hardware. Speaking of the previous generation of consoles, the aforementioned Wii managed to do what the Kinect could not by bringing their technology together with talented and dedicated developers. It functioned very differently from the Kinect though as the sensor bar wasn't nearly as advanced as the Kinect camera and merely served as a way to receive the inputs from the Wii remote. The Wii remote was largely where all of the complicated calculations were being made, most notably with the accelerometer within the remote that would record the direction input with the X, Y, and Z axis, strength of the force, and convert that information into data that would then be sent to the sensor bar, which of course was hardwired directly into the console itself, so the data could then be represented on screen like any other conventional input would. This was a big step in motion controls for many reasons, but mostly because it primarily focused on putting 
the bulk of the technology in the peripheral itself instead of in the console. This was a result of the Wii being completely designed around motion controls, unlike previous iterations of the idea which made motion controls optional and based on preference. The PlayStation Move was also notable as it did replicate the look and feel of controlling a Wii game but with much more accuracy as the Move camera implemented similar technology to the Kinect, combining that information with the information collected by the controller in a similar way that the Wii Remote did, and that added up to a superior motion experience most of the time, but obviously was experienced by way less people as it was a separate idea and not really married to the PlayStation 3 the way that the Wii Remote was married to the Wii. Today we predictably find ourselves completely submerged in the next iteration of motion controls with VR headsets. At first glance, the PlayStation VR, Oculus, and HTC Vive do seem light years ahead of the Wii, and they are on paper, but a lot of the ideas of motion data being collected and combined from the controller and an external sensor are still there. The VR headsets all collect the same data that the Wii Remote did, although much more of it and it's much more precise as a result, while also using cameras to track the movement of the headset itself. The different headsets put different levels of emphasis on different areas in this process, but they all add up to a similar process in their mission to bring as many frames per second as possible with a 1080p or higher display to trick the player's brain into thinking it is in a three-dimensional world. Frame rate is a huge factor with these headsets since any major dip in frame rate will break the experience and therefore the illusion on the brain, which results in motion sickness for many. And as we all know, our current slew of consoles and many gaming PCs still struggle to hold on to 60 or more frames per second at 1080p resolution. So this VR functionality, while surprisingly effective at times, still has a way to go before the average gamer can expect standard immersion throughout their entire VR catalog. Perhaps, as many seem to think, VR is the conclusion to the story of motion controls. Maybe all it needs is to just get better and better, and we are in the final chapter of perfecting motion controls, but perhaps not. As anybody who looks back on the history of motion controls will quickly see, this input style has gone through so many overhauls and reimaginings over the decades that it isn't difficult to imagine another being on the way. Not all gamers want to set up cameras and wear expensive headsets that separate them from their friends in the room. Perhaps the real conclusion to motion controls is some sort of projection method that brings the game outside of the console and into our living rooms, or some combination of that and what we have with VR like the enigmatic HoloLens seems to be aiming for. I personally still wonder if motion controls will ever be standard at all, as gaming is still overwhelmingly enjoyed by players who are more than satisfied with just sitting on a couch with a comfortable controller and staring at a decent screen. But as the technology continues to grow and get cheaper, I doubt the lineage of motion controls is done, and we'll probably see many more iterations in a much shorter amount of time moving forward. And that about does it for this video. If you enjoyed what you watched and want to see more from Gaming Bolt, you can always hit that subscribe button and turn on the bell icon next to it. That way you will never miss any of our videos.